afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us on another of our Safer at Home series um, on a sultry day in Falmouth. Um, hopefully everybody's in air conditioning because it's uh, summer has arrived on the Cape. Um, a couple di different things, uh, probably you guys are all veterans now, you know the, you know the rules, but uh, if you've got a question down at the bottom, there's a, there's a chat feature, so type it in down there. Uh, if you would, make sure you mute yourself. Um, uh, but we, we like seeing you, so you can leave your picture on if you like, or you can turn it off if you like. Um, uh, our, all our lectures are brought to you by uh, the, to the courtesy of, um, of Cape Cod 5, uh, First Citizens Federal Credit Union of uh, Martha's Vineyard Savings. And also we want to uh, give a shout out to our friends over at uh, Eight Cousins Bookseller, because they have copies of all the books. Um, and uh, I want to welcome today uh, our, our guest, uh, Thurston Clark, who's the author of uh, 13 books, I believe, Mr. Clark, right? He's an American historian, journalist. Yeah. And, um, um, and this is a topic that um, I, as an historian, I, and everybody who knows me knows I love military history, but it, in many ways, talking about Vietnam, this is the electrified third rail. We know, we, we, we know that lots and lots of books are written about World War II. Um, people, st you know, still don't seem to wrap their arms around something like Korea, but, but, uh, um, Vietnam seems to elicit a lot of, uh, a lot of emotions. So it's, um, and, and you talk about in this book, the leadership of some people that we have heard of, and one we probably haven't heard of, you know, Gerald Ford, Henry Kissinger, Richard Nixon, but also a, a guy named Graham Martin, who's the U.S. ambassador to South Vietnam. So, mm -hmm. Um, let me start by asking, why did you choose this subject? Um, well, first of all, I think it's one of the, for the United States, one of the only really good news stories out of Vietnam. I mean, that may be a strange thing to say about um, the last six weeks of a war that we were on the losing side of. Um, but at the same time, I was struck by the fact that 130,000 South Vietnamese were evacuated uh, from their country in six weeks. They were all flown to the United States where they were processed through uh, resettlement camps and given American citizenship. It's an extraordinary act of humanitarian grace um, after a contentious and difficult war for the United States. And I, I'll tell you what, what first put me on it. Um, a very good friend of I live up in the Adirondacks up in upstate New York, and a high school classmate of my uh, daughter's um, went to uh, into the army after graduating from college as an intelligence officer, and he was posted to Afghanistan. And after he came back, um, he was telling me how impossible, hard it was to get visas. Uh, for his translator and some of his fixers and facilitators who had risked their lives and those of their families um, to get to the United States. And so this, when I heard this story, it, it kind of reminded me of that famous uh, photograph and of the helicopter taking off from a roof in Saigon, um, which was pretty much all I knew um, about the last days of the Vietnam War and our evacuation. And of course, that helicopter uh, image is very famous and very iconic. So I looked into the picture a bit more, and I found that almost everything I had assumed about that photograph was wrong. I'd assumed, as a lot of people still do, that it was uh, taken on the roof of the American embassy. Uh, and I assumed that most of the people in the helicopter were Americans, a few Vietnamese, um, and that it was a, a military, a U.S. military helicopter. Uh, instead, I found out that it was actually uh, taking off from the roof of an apartment building uh, in downtown Saigon, um, and that it was, uh, the roof was one of 10 or 12 roofs that had been prepared for just this kind of an evacuation. And the people on the staircase who were climbing the stairs to the helicopter were all Vietnamese, um, most of them Vietnamese civilians. The pilot of the helicopter, 
was a civilian um, who was working for um, Air America, which is the proprietary airline of the CIA. It's not run; it was not run directly by the CIA, but it was uh, uh, owned through various um, um, dodges by the CIA. And then I found out more about the pilot, and uh, and about the man in the white shirt who's leaning down to um, pick out help one of the Vietnamese people into the helicopter. And it turned out that he was a, na a man named Oren Hardage, and um, famous for being a hard drinking kind of good old boy in Saigon. He lost an eye in Okinawa, um, in the Battle of Okinawa during World War II, he had a patch over his eye. Well, he almost lost his eye, but it, he had a piece of shrapnel in it. And he didn't know the people that he was rescuing, but he felt that um, it was his duty that you don't you leave your uh, allies on the battlefield, uh, even if they're civilian allies. And when he uh, packed these people he, into the helicopter, in order to take two or three more strangers, uh, he himself rode on the skids of the helicopter from the roof of the building um, to Tanzanut Air Base, where the people were put in a larger helicopter to be taken out to the, to the um, fleet, American fleet. Um, and he stood on the skids holding a, a submachine, a Swedish submachine gun in one hand. And he had one of the Vietnamese passengers grab his other arm because he was afraid there was a lot of ground fire, uh, either from the North Vietnamese or from angry South Vietnamese troops who felt they were being abandoned. And he, if he was hit, he didn't want to fall to his death. Um, so what I originally thought was a photograph uh, showing a, a great moment of American shame was actually a moment showing, uh, it was a photograph showing a great moment of heroism. Um, and that really started me off on um, my interviews with the Americans. I, uh, several of the Vietnamese referred to them as American Schindlers and American Wallenbergs, comparing them to righteous Gentiles who had rescued um, Jews during the Holocaust. Um, and in fact, some of these Americans did risk their lives and their careers um, because for much of the uh, six weeks prior to the end of the war, uh, the official U.S. policy was not to take uh, the Vietnamese civilians out. And in fact, uh, the U.S. Congress and congressmen, uh, many congressmen, particularly anti-war congressmen, were very much against it. So that's how I kind of launched into this. And then I started interviewing people. And I found that there was essentially what I call a kind of uncoordinated uh, mutiny on the part of a number of American uh, diplomats, central intelligence um, officers, uh, military people, civilians in Vietnam, to defy the official policy of the Pentagon and the U.S. government at the time and get, these, uh, get their Vietnamese out on what amounted to a kind of underground railway. And in the final uh, days of the week of the war, finally the Ford administration um, played catch up and um, legitimized what they'd been doing and brought out tens of thousands of more, more Vietnamese. So your story focuses pretty much on the last six to eight weeks of the, of the war, correct? You, you don't you focus on the whole war, you focus on March, April 75, correct? Yes, I, I focus, the real focus is on open book more or less with the first great um, North Vietnamese offensive in Jan early January. Um, and I take it through the end of April in 1975. Mm -hmm. um, What's going on? What's the situation in Vietnam at the time? And who are some of these leaders you were referencing? I think I, said, I might have mentioned them a couple at the top of our of our talk. But uh, lay lay the groundwork. What's what's happening in Vietnam at this moment? Well, what had happened is two years uh, two years earlier, the United States and South Vietnam, uh, United States, South Vietnam, North Vietnam, and the uh, communist. Um, 
organization, we call it the Viet Cong in South Vietnam, uh, the communists all signed an agreement, Paris Peace Accords. And as part of the accords, the United States agreed to remove all but 50 uniformed military personnel from South Vietnam. Uh, and this was in 1973, and we did so. And in exchange, the South Vietnamese, I mean, the North Vietnamese released the American uh, prisoners of war who had been held in, uh, in, um, in Hanoi. Uh, that's how John McCain got out and others. At the same time, however, um, the North Vietnamese army, which occupied uh, sections of uh, South Vietnam, particularly in the central and northern highlands, was allowed to keep roughly about 100,000 troops of its troops in um, South Vietnam. Um, and so for the next two, for the next almost two years, uh, there was a kind of low-grade war going on between the North Vietnamese forces and the South Vietnamese army. Um, American military was not involved anymore. As I said, we only had 50 uniformed personnel there. Um, and at the beginning of 1975, um, the North Vietnamese launched um, a, an attack on a provincial capital about 60 miles from Saigon that they took. And then in March, uh, there was an all-out offensive uh, in the Central Highlands uh, and, uh, and also against uh, Da Nang. And the South Vietnamese army collapsed um, and evacuated and fled from their positions in northern South Vietnam and central, uh, the central part of the country, um, and fled towards uh, Saigon. And they were... Uh, hundreds of thousands of, of refugees from the from these um, provinces that headed south uh, and it was a catastrophe and it was at this point that um, slowly um, Americans in Saigon began putting an, a, at risk South Vietnamese um, on the uh, transport planes that were flying equipment and supplies in for the South Vietnamese army into Tanzanut Air Base in Saigon and uh, going back empty to the to the Philippines. Instead, and in Guam, instead these planes began to uh, arrive with dozens and then uh, several hundreds of um, South Vietnamese refugees who had no papers, no visas for the United States whatsoever. Uh, this caused a bit of a flap, um, and there were protests lodged by the Philippine government. Um, and the U.S. Ambassador Graham Martin tried to put an end to it, but actually the uh, military attaché, General Brigadier General Homer Smith, um, in who was at Tanzanut, was you know half an hour away or so, twenty minutes away from the embassy. And he more or less looked the other way. Um, and we had another problem, too, um, in these early days, which was that we had uh, about 7,000 Americans, uh, citizens, were living in South Vietnam. Uh, some of them, many of them were contractors. Some were soldiers who had stayed after the war. Many of them had South Vietnamese wives and girlfriends and families. And they refused to leave without their families. And uh, Homer Smith was, uh, and the, the Pentagon and Washington and the Ford government was uh, particularly, particularly um, uh, the Senate, senators and congressmen were urging the United States to get these Americans out. Well, there was no way to force them out except at the point of a, a, a gun barrel to, to, get, to get rid of them, uh, to get them to get on planes and leave. And there were a number of meetings held with the representatives and with of these contractors and Americans. And finally, they were told that, yes, they could take their wives and children out. And one of the Americans, uh, when he heard this, said famously to the, uh, brief, the Army briefer, what is it that you don't understand about families? Uh, and families, of course, in Vietnam uh, include uh, 
nieces and nephews and, and cousins and uh, in-laws and on and on and on. So the average Vietnamese family would be you know, 30, 40 people or so. And so the Americans, a lot of them dug their heels in and they said they wouldn't leave uh, unless they could take the whole Vietnamese families out. And so what, what happened next was that um, um, General Smith figured out a way to do this. And he, he composed and got Graham Martin to sign off on it, a, a letter of support, an affidavit of support, in which any American uh, resident in, in South Vietnam could list the family members um, that he wanted to take out. And you could take, you take this piece of paper, this affidavit, you'd sign it, you take it to San Salut with your family members, it would be processed and stamped, and you'd, and you'd get on a plane. Now, what happened pretty quickly was that a number of Americans who wanted to get out people who were unrelated to them, who they thought were at risk, um, filled in 10, 20, 30 of their so-called adopted children. And they just claimed that they'd adopted all these Vietnamese. I mean, a 30-year-old American would claim that he'd adopted a 50-year-old Vietnamese woman and so on and so on. And it was clearly um, not true. Um, however, the American diplomat, uh, Ken Morfield, who was then in charge of processing um, the affidavits, and providing visas uh, and for Vietnamese I had set up a branch of the consulate at Tan Son Ut Airport. And he simply stamped the things and let people go, um, as did a lot of the other diplomats and military who were there. They didn't want to stand in the way of these, uh, of these people escaping. And I asked Ken and I asked a lot of the Americans who took part in this underground railroad why did you do this? Why did you, you know, stretch the law? Why did you take this risk? I mean, they were endangering their careers. Why did you do this? And again and again, they said to me, you know, I don't think I could have lived with myself. Um, you know, 10 or 20 years later, I would have still seen the faces of the people that I left behind. So I, I, th there was that, and again and again, I heard that as the main motivation that people had uh, for taking part in for taking part in this. And a number of uh, of um, Vietnamese kept in touch with their American rescuers for years and years um, after the war. So uh, there was this this feeling of. Um, trying to avoid what they thought would be a, a, a great amount of, of guilt on their part if they just got on a plane and left these people behind. Um, to illustrate that, I can illustrate that a bit more, there were two American Foreign Service officers who had served um, in Vietnam various uh, times, Lionel Rosenblatt and Craig Johnstone. And they were both in the um, State Department uh, in Washington when Saigon was clearly going to fall. And so they asked permission to go there, and they were told they couldn't go. That they, you know, it was forbidden for then for any American diplomats or, or, or official personnel to go because the theory was they were just going to have to be. Um, evacuated the next day, and they didn't want all of these extra Americans there. So Rosenblatt and Johnstone, um, they simply went AWOL. They bought their own air tickets to Saigon. They left their jobs without permission. They flew in on the last scheduled Pan Am plane. They found a safe house um, in downtown Saigon. They began meeting, they wore disguises because the State Department had cabled the embassy to find them and arrest them and de deport them immediately. And so State Department security personnel were looking for them. So they had to avoid the other Americans. They met people um, very cloak and dagger in um, the post office, in the cathedral. They stashed them in the 
in the safe house, and then they organized their transport to uh, to the airport and had to smuggle him onto the airport with forged papers, um, and left uh, two or three days later, having probably gotten 500 people, uh, people they knew, and uh, family members of people they knew, and gotten them out of the country. And so when they got back, they got back to Washington, and about a week after Saigon fell, there was a story about their exploits in the Washington Post. And Kissinger read it, and um, as did Lawrence Eagleburger, who was his assistant. And Eagleburger called them onto the carpet uh, to get a, a dressing down from Kissinger. And so they went in to see him, to see Kissinger with Eagleburger. And Kissinger said to them, um, you know, you did something, you know, very illegal. I'm trying to have a disciplined State Department. You guys just went off on your own. Um, and you got all these people out. And then he stopped and he said, and if more people had acted as you did, we would have had a much more honorable departure from Vietnam. He said, you did the right thing. And then he turned to Eagleburger and he said, um, if you bring anything, a case like this again before me, it'll be you who's gonna be in trouble and not them. And then after that, Kissinger asked them where they would each like to serve next. And they each gave their kind of dream postings. And he turned to Eagleburger and he said, make it happen. So you see, the, Kissinger was in a funny position. Kissinger had won the Pulitzer Prize. Um, I'm not Pulitzer, I'm sorry, the Nobel Peace Prize with uh, the, his North Vietnamese counterpart uh, in 1973. And in fact, when the wheels began to come off South Vietnam at first, um, he proposed to Ford, he said to Ford that he was thinking of repaying the money from his uh, Nobel Peace Prize and, and, and returning it. In the end, he didn't, um, he didn't do that. But um, in the final couple of days, um, Kissinger was more of an ally of the people who were trying to evacuate Americans. Uh, I mean, uh, the, uh, more an ally of the Americans who were trying to uh, evacuate South Vietnamese than he was of Graham Martin and of the hardliners in the Pentagon, in particular of the hardliners in, in Congress, in the Senate. The biggest barrier to um, a larger and, and, and more successful evacuation was the antipathy of the American people as uh, represented by their Congress, uh, represented the Congress. Uh, to having a huge number of Vietnamese refugees in the United States. We were sick of Vietnam. Um, there was a certain amount of racism involved. Um, we had 9% unemployment. It was a difficult time. The last thing people wanted was a couple of hundred thousand Vietnamese on their doorstep, which is in the end exactly we got 130,000 Vietnamese. So it took a, a certain amount of courage for Ford, which Ford did do, to stand up to uh, Congress and to say and to push through after the uh, evacuation had happened, uh, money for the resettlement of the uh, of the refugees. You touched on some names that we've heard of, you know, Gerald Ford, Henry Kissinger. Um, um, him mentioned Nixon, but he's obviously involved. And, and Graham Martin, how would you describe, how would you, how would you characterize the leadership, uh, you know, from Washington and, you know, and obviously in South Vietnam as well, because Martin's the ambassador. And was it basically, you know, first of all, that that's one question. And then you just touched on something too. Is that why it was so unusual about the evacuation of the South Vietnamese, these are, these are ostensibly our allies, and yet it, it doesn't seem to be met with this universal approval. Is it just a, a, essentially racism or? Uh, no. So, yeah, two, two, two questions in one there, I guess. Yeah. I, there, there was certainly a, a certain amount of racial animus, and there was also a feeling, particularly in the anti-war movement, 
that the South Vietnamese were unworthy of being rescued, that uh, there was the narrative was that the South Vietnamese government was corrupt and vicious and uh, inefficient and didn't deserve uh, our monetary support or military support, and particularly uh, President Chu. Um, so there was, there was that um, feeling. And for example, uh, I, I, the public um, opinion polls show the American people really against uh, having a Vietnamese refugee. There was a question asked in April, um, the, uh, I think it was a Gallup poll, that said if, um, if you thought more aid, um, first of all, the first question was, should we accept uh, refugees from uh, Vietnam and Cambodia? And overwhelmingly, I think, you know, kind of 60%, 70%. People said no. And then they said, well, should we supply them with more arms and aid and assistance if that would prevent a bloodbath in the event of a communist victory? And still, the majority of American people said no. Um, there was an incredible callousness towards the South Vietnamese um, late in the, in, the, in the final years of the war, particularly after the Paris Peace Accords, when Americans felt that we had lost our hands of it. You know, George McGovern, um, who had run for president in 1972 and was a senator, um, after the uh, evacuation had happened, uh, he recommended uh, sending the Vietnamese refugees back. Um, and he said that 90% of them should be sent back. Uh, and that they, they, that they wouldn't suffer at all uh, if they were returned. This is, of course, at a time when two weeks before there was a bloodbath going on in Cambodia. Um, and there were a lot of other, um, particularly anti-war uh, uh, senators, who were very much opposed to what Ford did. Um, anyway, I got off on a tangent there. Um, you did ask about Graham Martin, who is one of the more fascinating characters. He um, was the American ambassador at the time. He'd, he'd come in 73. He had had a storied, uh, famous diplomatic, uh, very good diplomatic career. He had been an um, uh, ambassador to Thailand um, and then ambassador um, to Italy, ambassador to Rome. Um, and had planned to retire. And um, Kissinger leaned on him, as did uh, Ford and Alexander Haig, uh, to take the, not Ford, but um, Haig, Ford came later, to take the position. And Martin said no several times and resisted. And finally, they appealed to his patriotism. And Martin agreed to go. And Martin was a, a, a kind of interesting guy. He was a hardline cold warrior, but he was also um, a, a Democrat who's one of his two heroes was Adlai Stevenson. Um, and the way uh, he got his position in Rome um, is a good, it gives you a good example of how Machiavellian uh, Martin was. He was known to be a real schemer and a, and a backstabber. Anyway, when he was uh, when he was ambassador to uh, to Bangkok, um, Hubert Humphrey um, came um, and on a delegation of of businessmen and attorneys, and among them was uh, Richard Nixon. And there was a dinner party at the Royal Palace, and it came time to give a toast. And Vice President Humphrey um, began to get up to give the toast. And Martin put his hand on him, his arm and said, no, um, he said, I am uh, President um, Johnson's representative here. And therefore, I am supposed to be the one who gives the toast. I am the senior uh, 
government official. And so Martin stood up and gave the toast. And afterwards, um, he turned to um, Humphrey and to, and to Nixon within Nixon's hearing. And he said to Humphrey, if you ever become president, um, you know, I hope you realize that I will, you know, guard your uh, prerog prerogative and your position uh, in the same way I have uh, guarded uh, Vice uh, uh, President Johnson's by being the one as his representative to give the toast. Nixon never forgot this. And after Nixon was elected in 1968, the transition, his transition, one of his transition people called out of the blue, called Martin and said, uh, the president Nixon would uh, elect Nixon would like to give you a diplomatic post. Where would you like to be ambassador? And Martin said, Rome. And there was a long silence and they said, well, that's, you know, but usually it's a post that goes to a friend of the president, a contributor. Can you think of anything else? And Martin said, Rome again. And he got it. Uh, so this is the kind of man he was. Um, uh, one other story about uh, when he was in Thailand, um, he was recalled from Bangkok um, because he refused to endorse the Johnson administration's efforts to have American combat troops enter Thailand to help the Thai, uh, the, uh, Thai army battle the communists on the border with Cambodia. And he, he refused, he said, really, bitter telegrams back to Secretary of State Dean Rusk and uh, Robert McNamara at the uh, Pentagon. And as a result, uh, Rusk recalled him and gave him a kind of do nothing job in Washington. And he was finally saved by uh, Nixon coming into power. So he was, um, he was a, a very headstrong. He was a, a, a schemer. He was someone who believed uh, that, as he put it once, uh, I know more about Vietnam in this country than anyone else, anyone else in the American government, uh, which was not true. Um, so uh, he was also uh, invested in the war because his adopted son um, had been killed in action in 1965 as a helicopter pilot. He kept a large photograph of, of, of this uh, adopted son. The son was uh, the son of his wife's um, brother who had been uh, murdered in a robbery and they had adopted him and he'd been killed in this helicopter accident. So um, for Graham Martin to lose the Vietnam, the Vietnam War was almost unthinkable. And it's why one reason why almost until the end um, he believed with as did Kissinger and others that there would be a negotiated settlement and that the North Vietnamese army would stop at the gates to Saigon and uh, would, not, would not enter it and would then, would then negotiate um, a, a power sharing agreement with the current South Vietnamese government, which of course didn't happen and was never the intention. Um, but um, the North Vietnamese, with the help of the Russians, uh, kind of hoodwinked uh, Ford and Kissinger so that up until about a day before the end, they and Graham Martin uh, didn't think that um, Saigon was going to be invaded. And therefore, if you believe that, as Martin did, there was no reason to evacuate all these South Vietnamese because there would be plenty of time to evacuate. And in fact, uh, one of the stories I tell in the book is about three days before the end, um, the head, Tom Glenn, the head of the National Security Agency, NSA um, station in South Vietnam went to see the CIA uh, state, station keep, chief, um, Polgar, and he told uh, Polgar, he said, this is over, you're crazy, you guys have got to get out of here. All my signals and my intelligence tells me that the uh, North Vietnamese are going to be, uh, are going to come barreling right into the downtown Saigon in you know, two or three days. And he first told Graham Martin this, 
And Graham Martin led him to the door, put his arm around him, and he said, young man, when you're older, and when you get to be older and more seasoned as I am, uh, you'll understand these things better, but I can tell you that the communists have no intention of marching into Saigon. So after hearing that, um, Glenn went down the hall to Polgar, so the CIA station chief's office of, of Polgar, and he said, gave him the same news. And Polgar looked at him and laughed, and he said, I'll bet you a bottle of champagne, you can choose the vintage that will all be here in the embassy this time next year. And of course, uh, two days later, the helicopters were pulling Polgar and Graham Martin and others out of the embassy. So, you, well, so it's decided to get some of these um, South Vietnamese out of, out of their own country. Explain how, how did it work? What was the mechanics of this operation? Um, yeah. Was it, con was it consistent over the, over the, over the course of your book? Or how, no, how did no, it work? Not a, no, not at all. Um, what happened was that in the early days in April, there were these uh, South Vietnamese being put on um, Ill illegally uh, put on this, on these planes leaving from uh, Tanzania. Finally, in the last seven or eight days, um, the people in Washington uh, who wanted to evacuate the uh, South Vietnamese persuaded Ford and Kissinger to that a lot of them, there were already kind of 10,000 Vietnamese in the Philippines and these people were gonna get out. And so then they gave them a parole, immigration parole, and they started sending in planes to pick up people who had this parole. Now, I mentioned the family members of the uh, uh, contractors, which was, you know, thousands. So, in, for example, the 21st of April, there were a thousand or two thousand um, refugees leaving. Three or four days later, there were six, seven, eight thousand a day, and there was a steady air bridge of these planes. Um, but the even more, or not even more, we in the, it got out also, a lot got out by, uh, by um, ships. And what happened, um, there were a number of smaller ships, um, the Vietnamese got on this, uh, fishing boats and everything and got out to the American fleet where they were taken on board, even though the American fleet had no, the, the sailors had no civic orders to rescue them. Um, but about um, a week before the end, the Pentagon sent uh, Richard Armitage, um, who was a, um, had been a uh, Navy officer in Vietnam. Uh, he'd had five or six tours of duty. He spoke fluent Vietnamese, um, and he had very close connections with the Vietnamese Navy. And he had resigned from the Navy in disgust uh, because he realized that the uh, Paris Peace Accords were going to be a betrayal of the South Vietnamese, of the army, of the military. Anyway, there was a uh, worry in the Pentagon, of course, uh, among by particularly Secretary of Defense James Schlesinger, that the South Vietnamese Navy was going to fall into the hands of the North. And so to prevent this happening, they sent Armitage to Saigon the week before the end. Armitage went and he met with the chief of naval operations, Do Kim, who was a friend of his. And he explained that um, the United States would rendezvous, would send a destroyer to rendezvous um, with the South Vietnamese uh, fleet off of South Vietnam and escort the ships to safety. And at that point, uh, Kim looked at him and he said, well, you know, of course, that um, my sailors are not going to leave without their families. And um, they'll have to take them. And Armitage just stared at him and he didn't, as Kim later said, that he didn't say yes and he didn't say no. And Armitage knew what he was doing and what was going to happen. And so at the end of the day, when these finally on the last day of the war, 30 uh, South Vietnamese Navy ships 
um, left the port in Saigon, Newport it was called, and on board were 30,000 Vietnamese refugees, not just the families of the sailors, but friends and people who had been able to get on these ships. So these ships brought out, courtesy, thanks to Armitage, 30,000 Vietnamese men, women, and children. And they rendezvoused with the American destroyer and then headed for the Philippines. <clears throat> now the problem was that South Vietnam had fallen to the north and under international law, these ships now supposedly belonged to the North Vietnamese Navy spoils of war. So, and the um, Philippine government had said they wouldn't allow them to dock. So what Armitage uh, did with the connivance of the military, the captain of the destroyer were, they sent officers, American officers onto all of the South Vietnamese ships and they painted over, they had their numbers painted over and painted them with US Navy numbers they had a ceremony on all these ships. They lowered the South Vietnamese flag and they raised the stars and stripes. And suddenly all of these 30 ships became part of the American US Navy and were allowed to dock in the Philippines and disembark 30,000 people who then became American citizens. Obviously given what's going on in the world right now, we're in the middle of a pandemic. We've uh, we're seeing a Black Lives Matter issue. We're, we're still fighting overseas in Afghanistan. Um, everything that's happened and you know, what's going on. Um, in your opinion, why is this story timely now? What, uh, how, how can this appeal to well, all of us? It's, it's an immigration story, first of all. Um, it's a story of how 140,000, 130,000 uh, people were taken into the United States and give it citizenship, um, have that happen in a very short period of time. Now we hardly take any refugees whatsoever. Um, so it's a, it's a story of generosity, of American generosity towards, um, toward, the, toward refugees, endangered uh, refugees whose lives are in danger. Um, so I think that makes it uh, very current. And also there's the Afghanistan story uh, the question is, uh, what's going to happen um, if the Taliban returns to power or some kind of power sharing? What's going to happen to the Afghans who've thrown their lot in with us? They're going to be in a lot worse trouble even than the Vietnamese are because there is even less appetite in this country now to take large numbers of uh, refugees. And the, they don't have an easy way to get out. You have to remember that in South Vietnam, these people had to go by plane and ship. They couldn't go into Cambodia into the arms of the Khmer Rouge. They couldn't go north into um, Laos and they couldn't go to North Vietnam, obviously. The only way to go was out by ship and by plane, American ships and planes. Whereas in Afghanistan, they can cross into Pakistan, they can, which a lot of them have done. Um, so we're not going to be. Um, we're going to have a, same, a similar dilemma, but I'm not so sure it's going to have such a happy ending. Um, it used to be that a lot of people they were talking I mean, a few years ago when they were talking about a peace agreement with the Taliban, about a helicopter from the rooftop moment, uh, which is not impossible, that if there's a takeover from the Taliban, a slow takeover, a fast takeover, that you're going to see American diplomats and American personnel evacuated from Kabul. Um, so I, I, I think comparing it to um, having this as context for what may or may not happen in Afghanistan is timely. But it also tells us um, how we as a nation has, have changed in our attitude to refugees. Even though the American people overwhelmingly at the time didn't want the South Vietnamese, once they were here, um, public opinion changed very quickly within about six months. And it was largely Jerry Ford uh, who did that, who gave a number of strong speeches about how this is the American tradition to welcome refugees, that we don't leave 
uh, people who have allied themselves with us behind, and the country eventually got behind him and more or less welcomed these people. Um, compare that to the you know, situation we have today. Uh, it, couldn't, it couldn't be more dissimilar. And I think it's not just, um, I think it's, a, you have to remember the context, uh, even though uh, in 1975, uh, we were in a recession and there was a lot of unemployment. Um, Americans then had grown up welcoming refugees from, particularly refugees from communism. We had the, we had welcomed the Hungarian refugees, the Cubans. Uh, we had the World War II. Uh, uh, we had taken refugees after the war. Uh, so there was a, a, the people who were then in, living in the United States in 1975 had grown up believing that taking refugees was a noble uh, thing to do and, and very much part of the American tradition. Now, um, 45 years later, uh, we've had new generations who don't have that same experience and don't have that same feeling about um, refugees. And of course, a lot of it was the Cold War. Um, and we don't, the Cold War has been over, so we haven't had Cold War refugees. Yeah, I want to remind people that if you got a question, uh, type it down in the chat part of our, uh, on the box on, the, on below. Um, as we start to wind down here, um, a, another two-part question. Uh, were, were there a couple, were there characters that you really liked or didn't like as you're doing this research, like as you're as you're writing about this one or that one, you really got to really no. you really grew a fondness for this one or really unfondness for that one. And but second most, part, most most of the people that I interviewed were heroes, and I was very fond of them. But particularly um, Ken Morfield, who was the one who uh, processed people uh, with the affidavits. Uh, there were there were just there were so many. There was um. um one man, Bill Bell, um, who was a translator, sergeant, who was part of the American um, delegation. It's kind of complicated, but there were Americans who were there to liaison with the, with the communists, with the North Vietnamese and the communists in South Vietnamese to look for MIAs. Um, and Bill Bell, when the end uh, was coming down, there was this horrific, uh, plane crash, and there are a lot of uh, South Vietnamese orphans who were being brought to the United States on an Air Force plane uh, that crashed, and there were a number of Americans on it as well. Uh, his wife and both his children were on the plane, and um, his wife and son were killed, and his uh, daughter, uh, young daughter, was badly injured. And he flew back to um, California to be with his daughter, but then after a couple of days, he returned. And he said uh, that he felt a moral obligation to return because he knew Vietnam, he could speak the language, and he could see what was going to happen, and he wanted to help the Vietnamese people as much as he could get out. And he did. Um, in the final days, saw him racing around in a car and picking up Vietnamese who he knew and bringing them to Tons of Newt and smuggling them past the police at the uh, gate. And he became an expert in MIA uh, and POW affairs for the next um, 20 years. And it turned out being the first, was the first official American to go to Hanoi in, I think it was in, in the early 1990s when uh, to open the Amer an American office there to investigate POW MIA affairs. So there were, there were dozens of stories like his in, their, in the book. Um, but I became a lot of fond, fond of many of these people. Um, the, even the villains, the people who were you know, mistaken and made mistakes like Graham Martin, in the final hours of the um, evacuation, um, Martin uh, refused to leave. He was being pressured to leave and they didn't want wanted to stop selling, sending helicopters when they were still uh, more than a thousand people at the American embassy needing evacuation. And Martin just said, Martin, you know, pushed back and another 600 got out because he refused to leave. He finally was ordered by Ford to leave, um, which he did. 
Anyway, I'm getting a bit hoarse, I think. <laughs> I think. I think I'm going to have to call a halt here. Okay, one more question, too. And um, um, uh, with the people that you've interviewed, uh, has anyone not wanted to speak about what, what happened during the time? There was only uh, one person. I, I interviewed 50, 60 people, at least. There was only one person who was an American Foreign Service officer who had been in Da Nang and had been very traumatized by what had happened by leaving behind a lot of the uh, uh, consulate personnel in Da Nang, and he didn't. Uh, he did, and he resigned from the State Department shortly afterwards and uh, had another career and didn't want to revisit it. But that was it. The name of your book is Honorable Exit. As we as we wind this down, would you say that this, but considering that. Americans tend to look upon Vietnam with embarrassment or uh, they're not quite sure how to take it. Let's leave, let's leave it with that. Is this, did we, did we end on a high note? Did we, did, did we do something we should be proud of? I think the high note came for us uh, when these 130,000 Vietnamese became American citizens and became one of the most productive uh, and successful uh, refugee and immigrant groups that we've assimilated into the fabric of our country. I think that's the high point. Well, I want you to save your, uh, save your, your, your pipes here. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us today. I don't know if it's, yeah. if it's, if it's warm by you, it's warm by us. So I, I hope that, again, everyone stayed in air conditioning. So thank you everyone for joining us. Good luck with this book. Thank you for thank taking you. the time to join us today. And uh, it's been a great pleasure. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you.